Hi all, I have another fascinating game to show you from TSAC. This is Leela against Scorpio Neural Network. So not Scorpion, but Scorpio NN. Let's have a look at this game. So this is TSAC Season 19, Round 31. We have an English opening. This does seem to be up Leela Street, a positional opening where the pawn structure can play a big influence and role to show the effectiveness or not of pieces. Pieces can be really cut out if they don't live comfortably within a pawn structure. So we see here knight c6, g3, knight f6, knight f3, bishop c5, bishop g2, d6, both sides castle, d3, and then we see h6. This varies from a very high level stem game in this position, which is Magnus Colson played white against Britain's Michael Adams, who's also, you know, they're both unbelievably strong positional players and Adams has been you know on Magnus Carlsen's team uh, as well for world championship matches in that game Adams have played a6 and we saw after a3 uh, in fact Adams played something quite radical to sort out the a7 bishop in this structure we'll see later in this game Adams played uh, the move bishop c5 here technically white did have an advantage after taking and went on to win there in 49 moves. So Magnus Carlsen actually beat Adams in that game in London 2010. So anyway, in this game, we see h6. So there are potential concerns about this c5 bishop. And in some books on the English opening, it is emphasized how you can use the pawns to kind of lock out this bishop from the game uh, to try and stop it justifying its existence. Here we see a3, bishop g4, and this is the end of the book given. And now b4, bishop b6, h3, bishop e6. We see queen c2, a5. And now b5, knight e7. So it's a very positional nature, this this position. It's very nice uh, that it's more about the pawn play and positional play and, and making sure your pieces are comfortable and harmonious with the pawn structure we see knight d7 e3 and we can see that there's a hint of blunting the b6 bishop here so it's as if you know Leela has absorbed all the knowledge from English opening books for positional strategies this this b6 bishop is something to try and lock out of the equations we see c6 bishop b2 now and here d5 now we see knight a4 and in fact, the bishop goes to c7, and the move b6 is played. And black here is in a difficult state already. Black really doesn't want to lose a center pawn, and seemed to play what it felt was a lesser evil move, which is bishop b8. A very interesting move indeed here. Whatever black does, it seems black's getting a disadvantage already, a significant disadvantage. If knight takes b6, then white gets an important center pawn after bishop takes e5 with strong pressure. Uh, for example, here is going to drop b7 at any point, but otherwise, you know, things like c5 are being threatened. And white protects c4 quite comfortably in this position as well. Uh, so it looks pretty bleak there, that variation. And instead of knight takes b6, uh, if bishop takes b6, it's even worse just to give up uh, the dark square bishop. And you might think, well, what about this pawn? <laughs> you can just play rook d1 here. It's a very strong uh, position here. You're going to get the pawn back with interest. For example, here, rook takes b7, getting the pawn back with interest. Black clearly can't play knight d5 because of e4. So it's all going white's way. So it seems as though this is the point where the bishop has to go to b8. And one must ask here, are these pieces really justifying their existence? The only way really is if, you know, this this pawn's going to be activated. Is that going to activate the rook? Maybe black will have to try and take out the the A pawn later. <laughs> so so there's not really any great prospects for these pieces. They're kind of spectator pieces. They're struggling to justify their existence on A8 and B8. We see here E4 just closing the padlock on on that poor bishop on b8 this is sadistic positional play at work d4 we see c5 yep yeah, closing in the padlock a bit more f5 this gives 
it seems some breath of activity to black but there's a key e4 square which white grabs so perching a knight on e4 this seems very logical blockade of e4 still blocking in that bishop 97 we see bishop c1 and white's bishop by contrast to its counterpart enjoys some prospects on the king side looking at pawns to attack and maybe participating in a king side attack just for fun so king h8 king h2 knight d5 we see f3 queen c8 it seems rather pointless doesn't it uh, h4 though if there is some vague notion uh, but this is more about attacking than defending uh, if there is if there was some vague notion of attack it's not really but uh, knight e7 bishop d2 knight f6 we see rook b e1 knight f5 here now knight b2 so this does actually release the padlock on the pawn here for a moment queen d8 bishop h3 and white is willing to give up the light square bishop for one of black's knights so here bang bishop takes to resolve tactical issues now knight d1 and we see knight f4 a sharp tactical move white dare not take this this would actually give black at least a draw for example here check and then check and then rook f6 would be the key move for anything rook g6 if white takes then it's perpetual check time and if white doesn't then it's end of game for white here so this is a key move if rook e2 bishop takes and there's a strong idea of rook g6 and just mating so yeah it's important not to take the knight here that would give black much needed counterplay so instead this knight strengthens white's king position in the absence of the fianchetto bishop giving itself up uh, we have here now knight d5 a4 now this is a potential target which black realizes tactically that if it could arrange some pressure on a4 then maybe there's going to be some justifying the existence of both the rook and the pawn later if only a4 could be taken out it is a bit of a target we see bishop e6 giving the idea that actually black's interested in setting up a battery with bishop b3 here reverse engineering this that we could do as humans to find this plan but yes this is the plan chosen trying to get uh, grab this a4 pawn gab grab h5 we have bishop b3 trying to grab the a4 pawn now yeah this is swings and rounds belts though black's taking time out to win this a4 pawn and liberate to get an outside pass pawn which would justify the existence of the rook yes but white to plan the king side here by the way if queen takes h5 that helps white's attacking potential because the rook is eyeing the king here it's a good road um, for example here knight g4 is pretty strong for anything knight takes h6 so for example here knight takes h6 is devastating and if bishop takes g4 here then f takes is strong with g5 and it's a really really strong attack emerging for example like this and you can see that in this attack uh you know the rook and bishop are not helping matters they're really lazing around there spectator pieces so h5 we see bishop b3 black's going on this pawn hunt expedition we have rook a1 knight c2 and the interesting thing here is guess what leader plays here why why was rook a1 played you wonder what did white play here for 500 points if you want to pause the video okay g4 white delays the expedition to win the a pawn by sacrificing the exchange if rook a b1 had been played here even if black takes the pawn if we look at this a little bit deeper this situation with the a pawn it's not entirely convincing that white's attack won't break through later on for example like this because this bishop is so much more impressive than its counterpart you can imagine this diagonal being sensitive form pawn pressure on e5 white's getting significant advantage even here really it seems uh, but anyway we have this exchange sack with g4 here delaying things for black and we have rook g8 and now g5 
So black doesn't yet have the outside pass pawn as a counterweight, if that can be considered a counterweight here. Bishop d5, we have, if instead of bishop d5, h takes was played, then white's attack really is impressive. For example, like this. And the key point here is the dark squares are kind of very vulnerable with the bishop there. So the bishop on b8 is not helping, for example, ouch, <laughs> it's checkmate. And uh, yeah, it's just the bishop on b8 is really out of it here uh, let's go back so and you might think is there anything else not really uh, instead of g6 uh, let's look at what so we're looking at bishop takes g5 and we looked at queen f7 what about rook f8 there just to show bishop f6 is strong again Queen f2 might be a key move here to get onto these dark squares. And yeah, these dark squares are so key because they're they're not really defendable by that bishop. And we get a situation, for example, like this. If the queen infiltrates like this, then bang, knight g5 for check. You know, winning the queen, mating shortly. So there are disaster scenarios, and it all seems to be it's just not helped by the bishop being on b8 here. So let's go back. We have uh, bishop d5. Knight g4, queen e7, rook c1. So protecting that pawn. We see bishop b3 going again for this pawn. But the leader's not bothered at this point. G takes. And now bishop takes. Anyway, getting one of black's pawns around the king. Bishop takes a4. Okay. Is there a justification of existence here? Of the rook on a8 at least. And this outside pass pawn. The bishops just don't seem to be interested in king safety fundamentally. These guys are just not interested in king safety on this other side of the board. We see queen a2, which is interested in king safety, not just eyeing uh, the a4, but you know g8 sometimes might be useful. So bishop b5, we see rook d1 protecting the pawn, a4, and now a spectacular move actually, really re-energizing white's attack. In this position I wonder if you can guess it for a thousand points if you want to pause the video what would you do it's maybe it's a bit of a surprising move to you uh, my clue to you is then you know the knight is currently awkwardly pinned you know we can't use this knight so that's my clue to you you might want to pause the video a thousand points white to play King h3, yes, it's unpins, and it unpins, unpins in a very safe way, actually. If King f2 had been played, then check and rook takes, and black's getting a, a draw by perpetual check. So it unpins in a safe way, and of course, here as well, we can say that the g file is going to be interesting. Pardon me, for white. Um, so potentially uh, the g file. So a3, knight g f6. And of course, we're looking now at g8. Queen takes g8 is threatened. So bishop c7 is played. <laughs> protecting that rook. Black's had enough at this point. Yeah, it seems very devoid of defensive resources in this position. <laughs> uh, yeah, the knight and, and, and queen do have a killer common square. They, it is a combine and win on g8. If instead of the absurd looking bishop c7 to protect g8, if rook g7, then white actually can play bishop takes. And of the queen takes, white can actually play this distracting rook g1 to bring the queen over here to grab that f7 square. And it's difficult to defend against the mate threat of queen h7. If queen g7, then queen e8, and that's mating on g8. And if black tries a check here or here, you know, they just run out. For example, here, and it runs out, and there's no way of defending. Or here, queen f1, and it still is going to run out. Uh, sorry, queen f1. The, the king's going to go here, and, you know, any check, there's knight g3. So it does seem hopeless. Just rewind this. Uh, and you might think, well, hold on a sec. 
so we have this situation where bishop c7 is played what about queen d8 well there's queen f7 here yeah and we're looking at h7 so it's not really that many uh options there isn't a major number of options to actually defend <laughs> g8 here rook g7 seems to be the most promising try but yeah we have this lovely uh deflection just to create a, a neglect of f7 rook g1 yeah fascinating stuff so we do have this uh you know just giving up the bishop if the bishop is uh trying to give itself up now for the king unfortunately so we have knight takes g8 and now that bishop is taken and now queen d7 check king h4 yeah venturing up it's pretty safe because this bishop's not helping over there uh there's queen f5 played here if queen e7 check instead just to put this on the board actually bishop g5 and this is nothing for black you know that's it it's gonna be nothing and if queen takes c7 had been played then knight f6 and then rook g1 and we're sort of mating on g8 basically you know this is desperate because there's a threat of splat on g8 here with rook g8 uh so yeah it's all pretty desperate stuff there so queen f5 and we have now um a really crushing final combination blow i wonder if you can guess what white played here it's a forced checkmate essentially so white to play in checkmate in a few moves what would you play here okay queen takes g8 check was played we have rook g1 and here king h8 was played and now c8 dragging the queen over and now knight f6 so there's a big huge threat of bishop g7 or rook g8 it's, it's unstoppable checkmate so black played this and then there's bishop g7 <laughs> checkmate a comical game Lila made it look easy this is a 58 move game no hundreds of moves of shuffling a real positional massacre from Lila. a 58 move cute little game from Lila here Thank you, Leela. You didn't torture me on this occasion with endless shuffling. It was a positional masterpiece, it has to be said. <laughs> Spectator pieces on A8 and B8 just out of the game. An exchange sack just emphasizing, you know, black's going to be helpless for the kingside attack. But even without the exchange sack, it was still winning in those variations. This bishop. You know, on that diagonal versus that bishop, it was so, so superior. So very positionally instructive. So if you do play the English opening, you're in good hands, you know, because it's a choice sometimes of Magnus Carlsen, as well as quite often other positional openings, even like the London system. Uh, so in these openings, the pawn structure is so important. It plays such a role in liberating or making pieces seem useless without any justification of their existence and neglecting the king king safety issues can creep in that's the problem with spectator pieces on the queen side if your king's over there on the king side so a lot of lessons to be learned i think abstract lessons philosophical lessons from this game studying this particular game very instructive i felt okay i hope you enjoyed it as much as me if you want to check out my new course king's crusher tv slash opening tango there's the bit.ly slash Leela chess playlist, which welcomes this new addition. This game without hundreds of moves of shuffling. A welcome addition to that playlist. Bit.ly slash Leela chess. Check it out. Kings Crusher TV slash Discord. By the way, there's a team match letter. Come to the Kings Crusher TV slash Discord and see the link for a team match. We're having letter blitz. Um, there's bit.ly slash chess world if you want to join me for a game at five days a move just register at bit.ly slash chess world and i'll be able to invite you for a game soon after okay comments questions like share subscribe with the notification bell really appreciated help me feed the Euro the youtube neural network algorithms get these videos going spread okay so likes really important comments really important subscribes really appreciated thanks very much cheers then